Welcome everyone to our redeploying battlefield skills to the high tech sector panel. Uh, we have close to 100 people in the room, so it's wonderful to see such great participation and from many locations, no doubt. So we really have a great panel uh, and many experienced panelists from a variety of backgrounds, both in the tech industry, but also in the military. So we're gonna actually start by letting them introduce themselves, show a little bit about where they came from, from a military perspective, who they're with in, within the tech sector, and then maybe a highlight uh, that they would wanna share for us, and then we'll kind of jump into the questions. All right, so uh, this is the military, so we're, we're a bunch about being voluntold. So uh, <laughs> at here, here at the top of the, uh, of the uh, screen. So you want to start us off? Who was? Uh, Addie, I believe it is. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, Addie Casillas here. I am currently with Cisco, Cisco Systems. Um, I was in the Army, Army vet, 10 years. I served as a logistician and munitions specialist also. Um, I graduated from San Jose State University with my undergrad, um, business concentration, business analytics, um, and a graduate degree from the University of Southern California. Um, I have my MBA from there. Happy to be here. Um, look forward to telling you more about myself, but I'll pass the baton on to my next colleague here. Who's up next, Michael? Uh, we're going alphabetically, so Cassandra, please take it. Now, Cassandra, you're having a audio a little bit earlier. You're on mute. No, well, you're still muted, because there you go. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks so much, Michael. Good uh, evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra Dumas. Um, I was two years Air Force enlisted space and missiles. Um, I graduated from Norwich University, the oldest private military college in the country with a focus on criminal justice, homeland security, and Mandarin. Uh, today, I am within Adobe's strategic accounts functionality for our digital experience business and located outside Washington, D.C. And I have to ask uh, Cassandra's apologies ahead of time. This is not the first time I've mispronounced her name, so I, I, I have no excuses. Uh, with that, Thanks, let's uh, jump over to Heather. Hi, I'm Heather St. Peter. I'm a U.S. Army vet. Um, when I was in the military, I was in intelligence. Everybody stop laughing. Um, I graduated from uh, Kansas State University. There's a story there. I currently work in Adobe Systems as a uh, program manager in the engineering group. Thanks. We'll actually just queue up the rest of James, then Jonathan, Maggie, and Peter, if you want to round us out. Alrighty, hi everyone, uh, James Slayton here. I am also at Adobe and I work as a senior um, instructional designer and product manager on our Creative Cloud Learn team. And I was a Navy vet, so did nine, uh, eight years in the Navy as an intelligence officer um, and uh, was able to serve a bunch of cool places. And uh, yeah, so super excited to be here to talk to you guys about my experience. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Jonathan Duanitas. I'm a 10 year Marine Corps vet officer, I was an infantry officer, did multiple deployments. I got out to go to law school, so I'm presently a practicing attorney. Uh, before I was a, my undergraduate degree was in computer science and math from the University of Minnesota. And right now my practice, my legal practice entails helping people navigate through business disputes and unfair business practices. And I'm trying to develop an artificial intelligence practice where uh, as it's emerging now. And so, anyway, my former uh, law firm was Wilson, Sansini, Goodrich, and Rosati, kind of practicing on my own now, but that was a very prominent, or it is a very prominent law firm in Silicon Valley that um, has been an advisor of the tech companies since the dawn of Silicon Valley. So, very intimately familiar with, with a lot of the legal aspects of Silicon Valley and how that goes. So, I look forward to engaging with everyone and hearing what everybody has to say. Hi everybody, my name is Maggie Morales and I'm the director of the Veterans Resource Center at San Jose State University. And I am not a veteran, just lots of family members that have served in the military. Um, but I've supported those transitioning out of the military for a really long time uh, in career counseling and helping them make the transition. So I'm just super happy to sponsor, uh, help sponsor this event with Adobe. And San Jose State has been an amazing partner. We're grateful to have Maggie on our panel with a, quite an understatement. Uh, Peter, you want to round us out? Sure. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Peter Stadler. I'm a 
plus or minus about 13 years in the Army, started off in heavy artillery, reclassed into counterintelligence, got out, went to San Jose State, graduated with a degree in computer science, started off as a software engineer, um, and now I'm a project slash program manager at Cisco Systems. Um, let's see, anything of note, uh, you know, kind of the one of the things I had an issue with when I was doing my own transition out was uh, a lot of this stuff was just kind of getting rolling. And so I've dedicated a lot of time over the last few years to uh, greasing the skids for the next generation of veterans getting out so that we can, uh, you know, build a better pathway towards, towards success. Fantastic, thank you everyone. And I'm your moderator, Michael Isom. I'm also with Adobe as a uh, senior vendor relations specialist. So really helping maintain those relationships between Adobe and, and our, our business partners. I've been with Adobe for about three years. Prior to that, uh, lived in Saudi Arabia and deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, from an educational background, start off undergraduate in Chinese, then went to law school. Uh, for better or for worse, spent a number of years in the Pentagon and the DC area. So it's good to kind of move away from uh, the beltway, so to speak. But throughout all that, it's there's really been a, a tech focus and the partnership with between the military and tech continues to grow. In fact, a number of, you know, Cisco is one of the leading uh, tech companies to really develop that partnership and, you know, help provide that pathway for transitioning veterans. And so whether it's students that we have at San Jose State or, you know, transitioning programs with Adobe or Cisco or Amazon or Microsoft, there, there really is a great need for the ethos that, that veterans bring uh, especially in the tech sector. And that's one of the things we'll talk about today. Uh, with that, we'll just kind of go into a little bit more depth as far as, you know, what and any, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two things. One, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat pod. Uh, myself and some of the others are monitoring that and we'll queue those up for questions for, uh, for our panelists as we have a, a chance. But when we present those questions to the panelists, uh, because of the breadth of their experience, we're gonna let them jump on that for more proverbial grenade. So uh, does anybody want to kind of share what you did in the military, uh, specifically any unique stories and maybe those that kind of pointed you in the direction of tech? So actually, uh, I'll start off with that one because my, my journey into tech actually starts before the military. Um, back, in, back when I was in high school, Cisco uh, created a pilot program at my high school for uh, juniors and seniors to get their CCNA certification by the time they graduated high school. Now, they didn't start the program until like the last half of my senior year, so I never actually got certified. But that sort of planted the seed of the idea into what routers and networks and all that was. Um, and then after high school, I dove into the military, kind of forgot about it for a little while. But one of the things I always enjoyed doing was taking things apart, putting them back together, right? So. Um, from a very young age, tinkering with go-karts and dirt bikes. I'm sure plenty of people here uh, have a, my, at least a passing interest in tinkering. Um, that led to a career as a mechanic and welder. Um, and then I reclassed into counterintelligence and then software engineering. And the way I like to put that is I went from uh, analog problem solving to people problem solving to digital problem solving, right? The process is just the medium that changes. And that's kind of one of the things that uh, I like to highlight when I do these panels, because one of the things you need to learn as you're transitioning out is how to connect the dots and make it all relevant and tell your story. Get that get that 30 second elevator pitch down that ties it all together and shows um, that it's not just completely disjointed, shotgun spread, whatever, um, but that it actually builds on each previous block, right? Um, so once I, once I joined the military, um, I started off as a heavy artillery mechanic and basically just cross-trained on everything I could get my hands on. Um, if it rolled, flew, shot, whatever, I loved tinkering with it. And that led me over to the uh, counterintelligence side because I actually worked with a few of the Intel guys, the Ranger guys, some of the SF guys, um, and it sort of sparked that interest, right? And then after that, um, once I got out and decided to come back to Silicon Valley and make my career here, I knew I wanted to get into tech and that that little seed that was planted back in high school resurfaced, right? And then it was a full blown, all right, let's 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 see how I can apply all this dismantling and tinkering to the tech sector. Um, and so I started tinkering with computers, learning some programming, and like I said, majored in computer science, got my degree in software in computer science, and started off as a software engineer. 
the first company I went to work for was NASA. Um, had a little bit of fun there for just about a year, and then uh, I wanted to try my hand at project management and program management, and that brought me over to Cisco. So um, my career all total has taken some very sharp turns in some people's eyes, but, but again, in my very similar. Um, the, the processes are similar, it's just the medium that changes. You brought up a great point, Peter, and thank you for that you know, really fascinating background. Uh, something that we see a lot with veteran applicants and people that are transitioning is we've lived in a world where everything's an acronym, and we were kind of familiar with that lexicon, which what make, is what makes the military a profession, is that you have its own education, its own lexicon, and so forth. But a lot of times when those resumes come before a recruiter, when you say that, you know, you are a platoon leader or platoon sergeant or sergeant major, you know, those terms are lost in our talent acquisition folks. Uh, we'll come back to some of the, the military experiences, but does anybody want to jump on the uh, the question as far as, you know, maybe challenges they fa they faced when they submitted their military flavored resume and changes that they had to make in order to make it more tech focused or talent partner friendly? Yeah, I can I can speak to that, Michael. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest frustrations is like, uh, you know, you spend all this time becoming an expert in something in the military. It's like you want to like put that on the resume to show everyone like I went to the 18 different schools that taught me all of the things from like, you know, driving a forklift to, you know, how to serve like, you know, do properly, like whatever it is. I mean, there's a school for everything in the military. So you have all these qualifications and then, you know, you put them on your resume and, you know, that means nothing to anybody outside the military, right? And so, you know, kind of overcoming the hurdle of like what you expect your value to be communicated as versus what actually people will understand that value to be. And so I had a, you know, I had a pretty um, easy quote unquote uh, resume translation exercise that I thought I was like, oh, I know the, you know, commanding officer is the, you know, chief executive officer, right? Like that was like the, oh, easy day. So I kind of just changed a few words around and, and maybe just, uh, uh, worded it a little bit differently and kind of sent it to my buddy who was a uh, an army guy and product manager um, at education.com when I was when I was in the Bay Area doing my degree and he looked at it and he's like man this is like no one's gonna understand this I'm like no but I I, civil I civilianized it like I changed you know commanding officer like look you know and he's like like no no like you so any you know for the vets who are on this call thinking about their resumes right I mean like nobody actually understands any of the stuff that you're talking about unless they were a veteran right so get over this the fear of like well i you know calling myself a project manager when i was an officer like that's a lie or that's misrepresenting myself like and once you get past that and realize that that's the communication that's the value communication you're bringing that's when you're like oh, okay i'm gonna start being a little bit more focused on how people are interpreting my experience as opposed to how I want them to see my experience. And so I changed literally all my titles to be titles that made sense for a hiring manager. And like, is there an official title for that in the Navy? Of course not. Like, but is it misrepresenting what I, what value I'm bringing? Absolutely not. Right. And so I think that like finding those again, acronyms and stuff, that's low hanging fruit, right? You know, take out all the stuff that a civilian will understand, but then it comes to the idea that like, what actually am I trying to tell a hiring manager or a recruiter about myself and think about um, tailoring those blurbs and those titles and even like the the job, right? I mean, I have US Navy intelligence officer like once on my resume and everything after that is just, you know, locations and, and job titles that again, I know are gonna make sense for a recruiter, so. Yeah, if I may oh, Go ahead, Maggie. <clears throat> I was going to say a little trick to that too is literally just Google the job title of what it is you, you want to go after. Google resumes for that job title and then see the language that people put on their resumes that helps you write yours with civilian terminology. I add a more practical um, context to what James said, and that is um, I, I was in the military a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, when I first joined the, the tech sector, um, it was probably before many of you were born. And there, one of the challenges that I had there was that when people read my resume, they just skipped the military experience. It was gone. So I got, luckily I got hired at a startup in North Carolina, that's where I had moved to. Um, and the guy who hired me was a veteran. So he could, he could translate everything 
on my resume and knew all of the work that I had done and everything else. But um, one of the things I wanted to tell you guys as you're building your resume, um, especially the female veterans that are out there is, if you go get help with your resume and someone is trying to translate this stuff, um, don't let them erase stuff. Don't let them take stuff off of there. Anything that you did at all in the military, anything, any class you went, any course you took, anything you did in the military, fight for all of that stuff to be on the resume in some manifestation um, as a, as a skill set because all of it translates. And if, just because the person that you're talking to may suggest that you leave something off or may suggest that you word something differently, push back on that and make sure that they put all of that stuff in there. That's what I wish someone would have told me. Great, great call out, Heather. Uh, on a similar note, there is a reference to doing that translation. Google is part of their outreach. If you type in your AFSC or MOS or whatever your military code is into a Google search engine, it will show you the jobs that uh, that it, it equates to. And there are also other, uh, by the federal government and by other organizations that help you do that resume translation. So there was a question in the chat pod about, do you feel the skills that you learned in the military were fungible? Did they translate to what you were doing in the, uh, in the tech sector? And Heather, I think you mentioned uh, project or program management and to what skills translated and which skills we're a little bit a harder fit, uh, and anyone can open the question. Yeah, yeah, so there's a no call for guard duty in the civilian world, just in case anybody's concerned. Guard duty has no purpose in the civilian world. Just KP you know. maybe or no, no. <laughs> can I Maddie answer? This? About the yeah. Maddie, please, yeah. yeah, so let me let me answer part of this because um, so my my logistician job uh, in the army and munitions um, didn't have a lot of tech involved from the army. And uh, my business degree major in um, civilian side and concentration in business analytics had some tech involved, but I knew that I wanted to work business tech, right, in, in um, the business or, or the tech industry with that um, education background. Um, so a lot of my military um, skills and experiences that did carry over with me um, that I didn't know or I didn't realize at the time. Um, up until I had a lot of help, right? But people like Maggie and um, mentors and workshops and networking events um, uh, and those those tools like Google, um, that tool, the the translators were like, okay, so leadership, right? The the positions that I had applied for had been looking for. They required you have leadership. Yep, definitely got that from the military. I was a staff sergeant, so I had that. Um, I had given training. Okay, so the the job that I had been looking at. So I am an agile program consultant. Um, I know for many of you, you have no idea what that is, but that is a um, an agile program consultant teaches an um, agile methodologies, which builds on software solutions, um, the way that planes get built, for example, right? Big things, um, rockets, things like that. Cisco builds big enterprise solutions at scale, um, agile methodologies. So I'm a program consultant. Anyway, so the job I had been applying for, um, it evolved that I had to know um, how to deliver on that training, how to influence from bottoms up, how to um, give presentations, how to corral people, engineers, developers, communications, um, relationship management, all of these things that I didn't know I already brought to the table, time management, all these other things. At any rate, I already had those skills, right? All I needed to do was sell myself on paper, deliver at the interview, do a lot of practice rounds, um, and yeah, I got the job. So all those things I was already prepared for, didn't know I had it, got the job, I'm still working there. I started off in a, in a training role. Um, now I've grown into um, an actual execution role. So while I was in training and development at first, now I'm on the other side of delivering on that execution part. In, in operation. So. And if I may jump in too to caveat off of that, I think candidly, even if you just did one enlisted tour right after high school, you'll be amazed at the skill set that you don't even realize you have, first and foremost. Um, one of the blessings of serving in the military, no matter what branch, is you get exposed to just a wide variety and a diverse group of people that enables you to develop these human skills that you don't even realize. Um, because it was just part and parcel of being in a platoon or in a section or in a headquarters element. 
But what I will say, and I think what is probably more effective is what skill you don't have coming out of the military. And I will tell you this coldly, bluntly, in whatever way makes it, you know, hit your brain. You are not taught how to sell yourself. You are taught to be part of a team. You're not taught to be a salesman of what you can bring value to because you're supposed to bloom where you're planted. And unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way in the civilian world where you're expected to be selfish, where you're expected to like go after what you want. And so that takes some time. And I think that's one of the hardest things to transition out of the military. And so that's where you really need to develop that confidence. That's when you need to talk with those people that help you with your resumes. You have all the stuff in you, but you need to be able to communicate how to do that. You know, go away from the bloom where you're planted mentality to I'm going to go make this happen. I'm interested in this. I want to go get it. How do I go get it? And just be really aggressive by doing that. Jonathan, you know, Jonathan, it's so funny I, you mentioned that. Um, I experienced something very similar to that um, after my transition. And, you know, one of the key things I feel like any veteran knows is that uh, having been through multiple training opportunities where they build you up and build you back down, you are a asset when it comes to managing things under pressure. And so when I personally got out and uh, was in my first civilian career, uh, job, which was through a leadership program with AT&T at the time, I got actually pulled aside by someone who was a vet as well, who said, hey, Cassandra, listen, you know, I know you have a lot to bring value to here, but you need to step out a little bit and vocalize what you're hearing because your talent and expertise really aligns with all this, but you're staying a lot from the sidelines and more absorbing. So that was definitely something I had to overcome. And then the women may uh, chuckle a little bit at this uh, for those former female service members. When I got out, I still wore the sock bun because it was easy and you knew you looked professional. Oh, James thinks this is hilarious. And so does Heather. And, uh, one of my uh, female mentors at the time, a woman I worked for, she pulled me aside and said, Cassandra, you have to stop wearing that thing. You look too harsh and you look not approachable. And it's those small twinks you have to make when you get out because you're so used to just not focusing on the appearance and it's just about the job. And there's so much more when it comes to that from the civilian perspective. And that's just one little thing of note that uh, I chuckle at now. Well said, Cassandra. I'm well said. Because there's literally a sock in your hair. Like that's I didn't understand that. And someone was like, "No, sir, I have a sock in my hair right now." And like showed me that it was my first exposure to the complexities of having long hair, which I do now. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Wanna, one thing I want to add on there too is if if there's one thing the military gave me, it's perspective, right? Where, um, you know, I'm I'm reading the chat here too, as as some of you are asking questions and whatnot. Um, and, and one thing I want to point out is not just the, the difficulty in selling yourself, but um, in, in shifting your perspective where there, there's a lot of stuff in the military that um, is either extremely high stakes or made out to be that way. Right. And we all we all laugh at some of the jokes where it's like, you know, you, you have your hands in your pockets a nuclear bomb's going to go off. Right. It's like the, the most extreme set of comparisons. And that just becomes a way of daily life, right? Both for humor purposes, for stress coping, for whatever. And that is very much not the case, right? Where um, the stakes are much lower, the consequences are different. Um, nobody's gonna die if you forget to write a date down on an email, um, stuff like that, right? And so readjusting your expectations of, um, you know, kind of the, the pressure that you put yourself under, that your leadership puts you under, or that you put on to other people as a leader is another key part of the transition where you you have to change your flow and your pace and your, uh, your consciousness around a lot of these issues, right? Where um, that's one of the values that, you know, to, to go to Jonathan's point, um, a lot of the stuff you don't realize you have or you're not thinking about, right? Everybody's thinking about, do my skills translate? How the hell does being a sniper translate into being a software engineer or whatever, right? Where it's completely disjointed, disconnected, whatever. But at the end of the day, what a lot of the a lot of the companies are realizing and a lot of what the, the value to the veteran, the value that the veteran brings to the company is not necessarily those directly aligned technical skills, but all the soft skills that you can't just teach somebody in a three month quarter long class, two hours a week, right? It's the stuff that you learn, the perspectives you learn, the the work dynamics, the interpersonal communication, um, how to work with people from all over the country, if not all over the world, in various different backgrounds, 
uh, be, because you have a shared goal, shared purpose, shared drive, shared dynamic. That's the kind of stuff that um, you can really, uh, if you will, ham up in a, resi in a resume. Those interpersonal skills are critical, Peter, and I think translating those is, is one of the harder things, uh, but something that, you know, with practice and with assistance, we can all do. I saw a number of plus ones for Jonathan's comment about really <laughs> promoting ourselves. And I think one of the challenges we face is we have specific terms for people that like to promote themselves in the military, and they're not exactly uh, nice terms for the most part. So a question for the panel, uh, actually a couple of questions. First, let's start off with what, in the military, we have a very defined rank structure. And so how do you go from that sir or ma'am, and you know, when somebody asks you to do it, you're, it's gonna get done versus, like when I first came into the tech sector, it was like, well, that person's my manager. I, I better not go to them unless it's an emergency. Or what do you mean I have to brief the vice president? It's like briefing the general. Yeah. Or, I mean, so how do you break down some of those hierarchical constructs that we see in the military uh, in the tech sector. Can anybody share uh, their thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, what's I have a, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Cassandra. I was just going to say what's what's interesting specifically in a role like sales. Um, it goes completely counterintuitive to that military aspect of a. You only go to your superior officer if it, something is burning on fire, and then if you're going, you know, higher, hundreds of people are going to get killed. Which in a, opposition with sales, you can jump the chain of command as much as you want, as long as there is some valid reason behind it. If you need something, they're there to help to escalate the sales process. And so that was something that was very hard for me. And especially when I needed those resources for starting out is unlearning that habit of just because somebody has a title doesn't mean they're unapproachable. Yeah, and I will I will say that um, I definitely struggled with it, to be honest, right? Like I was coming from a position where I was, uh, you know, a director level. I had 43 people worked under me, civilian and military. Uh, and then when I got out and I, you know, after grad school, you know, became a one of one, as we say in the military, right? Like I would, like I didn't have anyone reporting up to me. I had a boss below me. And so um, I think that that was a struggle for me because I had, you know, all these ideas that I wanted to kind of implement. And they said, well, you know, no one actually works for anyone here. There's no no hierarchy, right? You know, you just have to convince everybody to do what you want because it's a good idea. And I think that there's um actually a big misconception. And the military actually is, yes, there are hierarchies, but it is not that you just say, like, do this, and then the people do it, right? I mean, if it were, that'd be awesome. Um, but it, we actually are as matrixed as Adobe. Actually, we're more matrixed than Adobe. And the org structure is more complicated. But, um, you know, everyone's kind of sharing a vision and executing towards the same mission. So I would go over to people who like needed to, um, you know, look at satellite pictures for me and I'd say, hey, can you do this thing? And they wouldn't say, well, is that really the best idea that I should be, like the best use of my time right now? Like, because they knew that what I was asking them to do is part of this mission that we were all collectively going through. And so I think the frustration comes through when, you know, you join a team, or you join an organization and there doesn't seem to be that unity of a mission or unity of a, a collected shared goal. And so everyone's kind of off looking to do their own thing and off, and I don't wanna say looking out for number one, but they're looking out for their own KPIs, right? To be real. And so if your KPIs don't align, then all of a sudden you're you're found in a position where, you know, I actually might not get what I want done because, you know, some, you know, person isn't kind of quote unquote playing ball. And so that, that was a really frustrating thought only because I'm so used to everyone fighting for the same thing. Um, and not because like you're not doing what I told you to do. Um, so yeah, I, I really had a struggle with that as I, and I still struggle with it, right? As we look across the orgs and, and different initiatives here and there. And, and so, yeah, I mean, to be frank, that's that's definitely something I, you know, I think is a really a true thing. The whole saluting thing doesn't matter. I mean, half the time people forget to salute you, right? So it's it's really, that's like, le that's not really what it's about though, but yeah. That's the important thing to do is uh, really wreck, well, not to be super, you know, melodramatic here, but you, you do kind of got to be a little vulnerable and open yourself up. Um, you know, when you're in the military, there is that uh, kind of, you know, you put the mask on, you have the hard face and you need to, you know, be resilient. But, you know, one of the, I would say, one of the things that I struggled with or I didn't appreciate as much is that I expected things to go a lot faster. I remember the military, like, get things done, knock walls over, do whatever it takes to get whatever needs to get done, done. And I expected, you know, given that I had 10 years as a military officer, that I, I 
you know, had the responsibility, but people don't really care in the sense that like they don't recognize or even can come close to appreciating the level of responsibility that all of us had at one point, particularly at a very young age. Um, so that said, things go very slow. And so you have to be kind of humble as far as what you can do and can't do. And most people want you to be successful. I do believe that to a T, even if, you know, you don't know what it is they want or you don't know what needs to get done. So I would encourage you just to be curious, ask questions. And the more thoughtful you are about the approach that you do and push it up to whoever you're working with, you know, I think that will get you further in the long run than any concerns you might have about showing any kind of vulnerability or weakness. Um, but ultimately, I think it's just being humble and recognizing things go a lot slower in the civilian world than they did in the military world. And it's okay to have like a two, three, four year plan to get somewhere. Whereas in the military, it might be like, well, you might move in three months. You might go to a different platoon. You might go to a different, you know, whatever. It won't happen as quickly uh, in theory in the civilian world. Yeah, actually, if I can piggyback off of that, that's a that's a fantastic point and goes back to what I was saying about perspective, right, where uh, in the military, it's it's kind of an expectation that if somebody teaches you how to do something and trains you how to do it, then like the next day you're going to be productive and active on it. Right. And that's just simply not the case in the civilian world. There's not this expectation that we're going to cram a four year degree down your throat in two days. And by Friday, you're going to be producing and launching, you know, live products. That's just Un unrealistic, right? Um, and so having, again, resetting that expectation on timelines where um, even within the different branches, there's quite a bit of variation, right? Where uh, Marine Corps, correct me if I'm wrong, standard tour is three to six months. Navy's like maybe six to eight, Air Force is three months. Army is anywhere from 12 to 15, right? Um, and in one tour in Iraq, we went through four Air Force rotations, right, where we were on a, a regional air base. My unit as an Army unit was on a regional air base with an Air Force unit, and we saw four different rotations come through in the same time we were there, right? And for us, 90 days was basically just settling in, right? We were just getting spun up, ready to go, and learning the entire city and the ins and outs of our communication plans, everybody else in the region, whatever else at 90 days, whereas for the Air Force, that was a full tour for them. So, you know, again, coming to the civilian world, you're going to have a very similar drastic gulf in expectations and dynamics and time and perspective that you'll need to adjust to. So just kind of keep that in mind while you're going through all this stuff, right? Don't let it get to you that something isn't moving as quickly as you hoped or something isn't happening as quickly as you hoped. Um, just kind of reset your baseline there. Let me tease that apart a little bit more, Peter, and I uh, amazing comments. The In the military, I think, is it, do you, did you feel that it was a, a challenge? Like if you were asking questions, it means that you didn't study in school or you didn't look at the manual. Uh, and does that translate into, the, into your civilian job as far as maybe an inhibition to ask questions or to ask for help, especially? Asking you, for help. You don't yeah. ask for yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't ask for help. There's no help. You, there's no help asking for help in the military. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> we're all watching. We're all watching. <laughs> Addie's laughing. She's right. Am I? I'm right. I'm right. Right. Okay. Yeah. See, we were all taught, and I still do it. I've been out of the military for 30 years. I still do it. I'm. I'm like. I. I have to like find the right supervisor 30 years out of the military that I have a good rapport with that I can trust. So that um, I can sit down with him or her and say, so is it really what we're doing? Like, I don't want to seem like the stupid kid, but, you know, we, with with with, you know, 30 years of experience in the software industry and having been <clears throat> a lot of us like Michael and Addie, I don't know if everybody did this, but um, Michael's got this great story that we did on um, in our diversity network. So I don't feel so strange saying this, but a lot of us joined the military as a way out. Is it was a way out of the financial circumstances that we were in. It was a way for us to change our lives, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of us have the same story. We, we joined the military. We got money for school. We went to school. We got out of school. And there's a lot of survival mentality. There's a lot of, I can do this. I have to do this. I don't have an, any other choice. That's what we were conditioned to do. And we get into this environment. And somebody asked in the chat pod how you build trust. 
in a technical environment because you know technical environments in and of themselves are kind of cold and culturally weird and awkward and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so you take all of that and you put it all together and then you drop a, a, a military a veteran in that environment and there's a lot of opportunity for you to not ask for help. <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity for people to, to fumble around in the dark for you know weeks at a time trying to figure out what to do. Um, and you really have to break yourself of that habit because the way that we build trust in the technical environment is through intellectual respect. And intellectual respect is earned by asking questions and collaborating with your with your peers and with your partners. And especially in Adobe, um, that is something that you see at all levels. You see, you see it everywhere. Everyone is, everyone is, a, well, not everyone. I'm not sure I'm going to walk up to the CEO tomorrow, but by far and large, there's people, you know, two, two levels above you and two levels below you who are easily accessible all the time. And you want to ask questions because it facilitates information exchange and it facilitates um, brainstorming. And, you know, Adobe's founded on the culture that good ideas come everywhere. And you think that that's a bumper sticker or a t-shirt thing, but it's not. That's literally the way the company is on the end. So you have to ask for help and you have to ask. That's it that's ubiquitous throughout tech companies. It's like good ideas, the best ideas often come from a place you never expected it. So Heather, you bring out a great point as far as going from A to B. Can you make comment on how they kind of came out of their comfort zone to start asking questions or to start, challenge, not challenging, but going beyond that traditional rank structure or hierarchy? Yeah, so, uh, I think out of everybody here, I'm probably the most recent to have transitioned out of the military. Um, I, I got my honorable discharge in 2017. So I've only been out for about three years, maybe four, if you count the year before that, because I was on IRR for the last year. But um, one of the things that I can make a quick call out on that I think probably quite a few people on chat uh, and on the call can agree with or identify with is um, when you're in that college classroom, right, and the professor's just droning on and on and lecturing, speaking to the whiteboard, whatever, they've already lost half the class, you know, 20 minutes back. Um, we're usually the first ones to raise our hand and be like, hey, uh, you know, if you don't mind just shutting up for a minute, you lost all of us, you know, like five minutes into your lecture. You want to go ahead and rewind and like, you know, we're, we're usually the first ones to call out that kind of thing, right? And while, the, while in a classroom setting, it feels like there aren't a lot of consequences for that, it's no big deal, whatever. In a business context, that can actually bring up quite a few, um, uh, I don't know, valuable call outs, if you will, where somebody might have completely overlooked something that has a drastic business impact or they just kept trucking on with it. Um, and as it turns out, that's going to impact three, four other systems over here because everything's cross functional, right? where to put it into military terms, maybe somebody, you know, has a little good idea, idea fairy on their shoulder and goes, hey, we're going to build this. And, you know, all the other lieutenants in the room just go, great, sounds good, sir. And then the, the senior E6 in the room is like, yeah, actually, uh, I think we're going to probably need to call in like the engineering battalion for that, because that is not something we have the tools, capability, manpower, or anything else to do, right? So, make those call outs. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. Don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to be like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm just dumb, but this does not sound, you know, accurate or something. By all means, make that call out. 100% every time, ask the question. I appreciate it, Peter. I'm oh, sorry, I go ahead. Comment on two things. So one, today is a perfect example of all the acronyms. So I love all the civilians calling you all out. Of what the heck are you saying? So this, yeah, is great practice. this is perfect practice because this is exactly what happens in interviews when people start using lingo and the civilian on the other side of you is going, am I the dummy? Because I they don't know what you're doing and they don't want to say something to you potentially. So this is great practice. Second point that I wanted to just kind of touch back on is reminding yourselves that um, we're all human. So we all have that common ground, right? Everyone goes through transitions in life. And so when you're really kind of getting stuck on that piece of like, how do I make this jump from the military world to the civilian world and kind of putting that that wall or that barrier up a little bit, kind of reminding yourself that we are all human and people genuinely want to help people. And so if somehow, some way you can connect 
to, I think I put it in the chat box, connect to somebody at a company that you have somewhat of an interest in. That's the beauty of LinkedIn is using that to be able to find somebody just so you feel like you can build a little bit of a common ground with somebody internally, and they don't necessarily have to be somebody from the military, but that does help break the ice, obviously, for you. Um, I think that's an important way to just kind of help get your feet wet a little bit into the whole job searching aspect of it, especially when you're newly transitioning out. Um, and there's a million people out there that want to help. So someone had asked, what can civilians do? If they hire a new veteran, what can they do? So I think that's a great point. If we have time at the end, if any of you can answer that, I think that's really important for somebody on the other end of how can they help? That was actually the question I had started. I think uh, Neil had put that in. It's like, I think we're going to make that our closing question. Uh, I'd like to go into kind of a lightning round. And uh, this is going to be revised presidential debate rules. So you will be mute to the power of the mouse. I will mute you at uh, one minute. But uh, trying to keep it short. But we're going to start with uh, Addy kind of going on. Some things that have come up in the chat, a little bit of a heads up. So Frago, as we call it in the, from an operations order. The uh, some themes, some consistent things that have come up in in the questions have been, you know, how did you negotiate compensation? Uh, have you experienced discrimination? You know, how have you transitioned? If you were a leader in the military and a leader in in tech, you know, what? How did your style shift? So, the other panelists take a look, take an opportunity to look through uh, the questions. If there's something else you want to address, we kind of want to go kind of one minute through one round, and then we'll kind of reassess after that. As far as if there was advice, that what's the hardest learned? lesson that you had transitioning from military into non-military life that you could share with with our attendees today and what was that one thing you'd want them to know mm -hmm. exactly so um either before you get out of the military um and if you don't have a plan to go to college make that plan before you get out of the military before you graduate college make the plan to have the job before you graduate Secure your salary and compensation package before you graduate. That's what I did. Um, to negotiate your, your package, talk to someone who works in the company already, which is what I did. A similar veteran in my situation um, negotiated not just the compensation, but extra, extra freebies that I would not have gotten had I not talked to him, had I not done that connection. Also was my referral person, so the networking, it's right here. Talk to your peers. Reach out if you don't already know anyone there. There we go. Yeah, let me build on that. So uh, I love, love, love it because I think we've all experienced that to some some degree. In fact, I didn't learn until last year. There is a program that the military will pay will pay you to go work somewhere else for your last six months during your transition. So you get to be a, a fellow or an intern or whatever you want to call it. But the military pays you to go work at Cisco or Google or, or Adobe. So these programs are just out there. It's free money on the table to help you facilitate that transition. Thank you so much, Eddie. All right, uh, stay, sticking with alphabetical, uh, Cassandra, what one thing would you want our attendees to know? Get a mentor. Uh, that was one of the biggest things that made a difference for me, and they can help, as Addie said, along negotiating your compensation, understanding the opportunities out there, helping tailor down who you were for me. Uh, military professional to a civilian professional while still maintaining your core competencies and having a mentor throughout your career, whether they're ex-military, current military, or civilian, just having that different perspective is so important no matter where you are and continuing that relationship. I wish I had like gold stars because it'd be all over the place. I think that mentor, uh, we have them in the military. We have somebody that when we enlisted or we commissioned, they were there to kind of guide us and walk us through the ropes. We had, whether it's drill sergeants or, you know, platoon leaders or platoon sergeants, we had somebody kind of guide us. Absolutely find a mentor, get out of that comfort zone, ask somebody and build that relationship. And, and industry in general is about relationships. Wonderful advice, Cassandra, thank you. Uh, thank Heather, you. Michael, if I can add two seconds, oh, one more thing. As Absolutely. a civilian, it's on your own is to go out and find a mentor. So get out, you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to build that relationship. And the relationship isn't based on the person who's mentoring you. You have to be the one to continuously follow up 
you know, make that next day to talk, communicate over email, set a monthly sync with them. You know, that's just something I've seen uh, as being a mentor, as a gap with people coming out of the military of not understanding that there's, you have to create the structure around it. Very, very good point. Heather, over to you. Um, I think what Cassandra said was actually really true. I think it's something that um, we all need to be told many, many, many times. You you need to drive that relationship. You need to drive, you need to lean in and drive that relationship. One of the things I wish someone would have told me when I left the military um, and went to school, but it, when I graduated school and I started into the software industry is um, you're different. Don't try to hide it. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't be ashamed of it, especially women in the military. We're tough. We're we're direct. We look people in the face. It scares the crap out of some people. Um, they don't like it. Um, <clears throat> men, especially. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be sexist, but you know, military men look at other look at women like soldiers. We were soldiers. We we're all soldiers together. So we spent X number of years around other men who treated us like soldiers. They treated us with respect and it taught us to expect that in the people that we're talking to. Um, you're not going to find that in the civilian world. Those men, military men are different than others. I'm not saying that there's civilian men out there that aren't like that because they are, but I really wish somebody would have looked at me when I first started in the software industry because I was a software developer for the first six or seven years of my career. And um, I really wish somebody would have just pulled me aside and said, listen, you're different and it's OK, but you need to temper this a little bit. You need to understand that um, that that you came from a world where life and death was the stakes that you were working on. And right now we're just fixing bugs. So let's like adjust windage for, for where you are and recognize that if you if you feel a little bit lost or like a fish out of water, that's normal. Um, and find support outside of your work environment for with other veterans who are going through the same thing because it's really important to have someone tell you that you're not alone and you are different, but that's okay, okay? And and kind of to, to coach you a little bit in, in toning it down a little. <laughs> a great point. I wanted to go back, uh, Cassandra had mentioned networking and earlier in the chat pod, somebody mentioned LinkedIn's resources. A, when you're transitioning, you get a, a year of free LinkedIn premium for that networking purpose, and they have some amazing LinkedIn learning courses. So please go and take a look at that if uh, if you're at that if you're at that point. Uh, James, Jonathan, and then Peter. Yeah, um, I will say be true to your you know be true to yourself and and actually be honest with what you want. Don't take the first job that's offered you because you're so thankful to have a job. You might take it, I did, but also take a pause. Is this what I want? If I want to be in a startup, join a startup. If you want to be in a Fortune 500, join a Fortune 500. But don't do the opposite because you have some sort of external pressure. You think it's the right thing to do. Like, do what's right for you. So and have that really hard conversation with yourself. Um, the second thing, and this is kind of what Heather touched on, is that like, um, you know, I wish I knew that just because I'm not a combat vet, that separating from the military wouldn't be the most, um, uh, you know, the hard, probably the hardest thing I had to do in my life, apart from like military training. Um, and uh, don't don't think that just because you're not a yeah you're not a combat vet that you're um what you're going through isn't like valid or isn't worth the, the time seek out mental health like i did like i see a therapist and it's because i realize there's a lot of stuff that i'm dealing with that is completely connected separating from the military and expectations i used to have that i don't that aren't there anymore and that's a hundred percent okay and that like you know what there's there's no shame in that so i just wanted to kind of give a plug for mental health to all the vets out there like combat or not um, so yeah, those are my, my two big ones. Let me just pause on that for a second. So when I came back from Afghanistan, it was right before 4th of July. It was not a pleasant experience. You know, I went into a basement, put earphones on, because I think it's, it, it is something that we're hesitant to admit, but even a number of us are, are from Intel, and it used to be like, no, you didn't have problems, you have a perfect life, don't admit it. Uh, but even within the security clearance realm now, they said, hey, if you've had it for PTSD or whatever your recovery is, don't worry about it. Uh, and so I think that's a recognized thing that we're not going to hide it. That's just going to make it worse. Let's admit it. Let's make that part of who we are rather than suppress it and have it, uh, you know, grow in complexity. Uh, Jonathan. 
Yeah, I, I want to just touch on that for a brief second too. I think that's probably one of the most important things you do actually transitioning is is being aware of that. Um, you know, it's an emotional experience to get out of something that you're very familiar with to go into something that you're completely unfamiliar with. And what comes with that is stress. And stress is normal. Um, but being aware of it is what gets you through it. And that's where, you know, opening up and being vulnerable and, and, and seeking help through either a therapist or just friends and being, you know, uh, honest with what's going on will help you get through it faster. So I, I really appreciate that, James, for bringing that up. Um, a couple, I've got like three things that I want to communicate as far as my kind of uh, final wisdom, which as a former officer, everyone's going to start rolling their heads because they know it's coming. But that said, I want to say to everyone that uh, this is a journey. This kind of piggyback a little, bit, a little bit off of what James said, which is your first job is not your last job. You're not marrying your first job. And sometimes your first job needs to be the one that gets you in the door and gets you going. And it's, you know, if you were to you know, ala and analogize it to, you know, military tactics, it's your foothold. It's what gets you going into the next room. And so recognize that for what it is. Sometimes circumstances put you in a place where you don't got many choices. Um, you know, COVID was not exactly the most ideal thing to happen to people that were just getting out of the military and looking for a job. That's the reality of it. So that said, you know, just know that it's a journey as you go through this life and that where you'll be in five years from now is not where you are next week. So that said, I want to comment just on networking. The networking analogy in the military, the theme here, is it's intel gathering. That's all networking is. It's not about getting your next job. It's about learning about your next job. It's about asking the questions of people to demonstrate, one, that you are curious about your career, you're curious about the space you might go into, and that you have a value that shows that you're willing to learn this stuff. That person you may be talking to may not have a job for you, but they might know someone who does, or they might tell you some insight that just changes your world as how you thought things. Go to Peter's point of perspective. So just remember, Intel, or as you were, networking is just Intel gathering. And so look at it like that, and I think you'll be more comfortable when it comes around. And then my final point really has nothing to do with job seeking or anything like that, but I think it, it's a collateral thing, which is volunteer. Go get involved in your community. You'd be surprised at the number of like-minded people who see that people with a good heart that go help the homeless, that go get involved in charity drives, clothing drives, whatever it may be, you might very well get a job out of that. And you never know who goes and does things like that. And it's, it's, a, it's such a beautiful melting pot of people coming together that one person leads to another. And that's just simply how the world works. Um, you know, my own personal commentary on like resumes and like submitting them into whatever bots and automated systems, you know, that's like trying to win the lottery. Uh, the real way that you go about doing this is being a human and talking to people. And, you know, I kind of segued that a little bit so that you can kind of build up to it. So there's always an option to talk with people. And I would say if you're at a loss for doing anything right now, go volunteer. Go out and serve your community and be surprised what it leads to. Anyway, I, if I don't get a chance to say anything more, thank you so much for uh, for this wonderful experience. And good luck to everyone. I have a minute for Peter. And then for the last five and four or five minutes, uh, we have a lot of our allies uh, as uh, as attendees today so not necessarily veterans but people that want to support and that are currently supporting and they've they've consistently asked how can they help so to our panelists uh while peter's sharing his his nugget of wisdom uh what would you ask what how would you say that our allies can help peter sure so um if if there's going back to your original question if there's kind of one thing one takeaway uh one piece of advice i could give right now um, to, to piggyback off of Jonathan's statements here, uh, it is a lot of intelligence gathering and to that, to wit with that, um, my recommendation would be, um, take a sniper shot, not a shotgun blast approach. So you're all here because you're looking for, for a job, you know, you're looking for that career advice. You're looking to advance, you're looking to move up in the world. And the best thing I can say is take a sniper shot. Do not just send the most generic buzzword bingo, you know, whatever slop together resume you can that you think will appeal to the most number of people to a thousand different companies and expect any kind of callback. It's going to be too cumbersome. You're going to go through automated filters. Uh, you're going to get 
you know, emails by automated recruiters that you are nowhere near qualified for. It's just going to result in mountains of failure, time wasted on both sides, both yours and the recruiters. Uh, it's just, it's a mess, right? And it only contributes to the noise and the static around trying to find that job. What I would say is do that intelligence gathering, right? So whatever university you're from, whether it's San Jose State, De Anza, Stanford, Berkeley, you know, wherever, um, whatever company you're trying to go for, whatever your role you're trying to go for, gather as much intelligence on that specific position as you can, and then go on LinkedIn, use their filters, use their tools, find somebody who is in a very similar position at that company who has, you know, you can filter by previous company on LinkedIn, go and set that filter to current company is, let's say Adobe, and previous company is or includes US Marine Corps, US Navy, US Army, US Air Force, whatever, right? Reach out to that person. Go ahead and be like, hey, you know what? I see that you're an Air Force veteran and we both went to San Jose State. We both majored in this and you currently work at Adobe in this area and this is where I'm trying to do. Hey, I looked up on their website and they have this job position that seems to be very much like what you do right now. Do you have time for coffee? Can I talk to you about it? Can we grab lunch? I realize that that's a little more difficult with COVID right now, but you can be like, hey, can we have a quick phone call? I want to ask you some questions. That's that networking opportunity. That's how you get those warm referrals, those warm opens, those warm introductions. That's what gets you past all the automated filters. That's what gets you to the top of the pile, right? And from there on out, beyond even this kind of conference call we're doing, beyond this panel we're doing, that's where you can get additional one-on-one -on -one tailoring with your resume. That's where you can, um, you know, to Jonathan's point, learn about opportunities you may not have even known existed. For example, like before I came to work in tech, working in a tech sales role wasn't even on my radar, right? But now that I've learned about some other programs, I'm like, oh, actually, that sounds kind of interesting, right? There's a lot of benefits there, pays similarly, whatever. Um, a lot of you might be just chasing, you know, what's the next biggest paycheck? The way I did it was I worked backwards from what kind of lifestyle I want, what kind of money do I need to maintain that lifestyle, what kind of jobs pay that kind of money, what's the educational track to get into those jobs. Start thinking about these things, right? Don't just hard charge, well, I'm going to go to college because I'm supposed to, right? Or I just got out, so I'm just going to go get my MBA because that's what you do, right? Start thinking long term and work your way backwards. Um, so that would be kind of the best advice I can give at the moment if you take nothing else away from this. That's fantastic. And really, I see a, a consistent theme as far as let's get outside our I can do it all myself perspective and reach out, whether it's to our peers or to to mentors. Uh, with the last minute or so that we have and uh, start with Addie, kind of throw her under the proverbial bus. You know, how can our allies help? And then we'll let anybody else jump on that if we have time. Um, I would say open up your networks, right? Uh, I mean, take things down, look us up on LinkedIn, use us, use each other, reach out. We're all here to help one another. And you know what? When we do reach out or when you do reach out, do reach out with, with a greeting. Don't just reach out to say, hey, I'm connecting and then that's it. Follow through, follow up. We're here. I'm going to plus one exactly what she said. Make it personal. I think it makes it a lot easier to make that connection. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one more, one final comment, and then we'll close. How hey, can Martin, our can allies help, James? Oh, I was going to say, uh, validate our experience, right? Like, if we have an, if we have something we we think would work, don't say like, yeah, this isn't the military. Like, it's not going to work here, right? Like, I've I've gotten that a lot in post military. Um, just listen and you know think about, hey, maybe actually that would work if we did X, Y, or Z. Um, so wonderful note, uh, and a perfect note to close on. We've had a so many wonderful attendees, and we've captured all the questions. We'll try to compile those and refine them and get get them back out. But thank you so much to all the attendees that were able to come in from so many places. And a special thank you to all of our panelists, and they're just the wonderful counsel and insight that they shared. Thank you, everybody, and hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Great talking to you guys.